For those of you who haven't guessed, this is Laxey, nowadays a normal enough looking village which offers few clues to its industrial past. Apart from that big wheel there. This massive wheel isn't just world famous, it's a symbol of Laxey's past as a mining village. Not only that, it's flipping huge. They say it's 95 steps to the top. And 150 years ago, there were hundreds of miners digging beneath Laxey, trying to get their hands on the valuable lead and zinc trapped deep underground. 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95. Wow, is that some climb. Well, from up here, you get a great view of Laxey, beneath which lies a huge honeycomb of tunnels dug by the miners. And it was down there that those hundreds of men would have spent up to eight hours a day working. From the top of the wheel, there's a marvellous view over Laxey and the miners' cottages down in the valley. These miners' cottages haven't been put here as part of a tourist attraction to make the area look quaint. They are in fact a genuine reminder of the once great industry of mining here in Laxey, because this is where some of the workforce actually lived. Now mining brought men from all over the island, and from Britain as well, although quite frankly I can't see why, because the work was hard, the conditions were appalling, and the rewards, well, some months non-existent. But it was an amazing time for Laxey. The village was packed with extraordinary machinery, huge water wheels, rock crushers, giant sieves, and a lift that could take men up and down a distance of 426 metres underground. It's hard to imagine that all this happened right here in Laxey just over a hundred years ago, but it is still possible to see what working conditions were like for the miners, and to see some of the amazing machinery that they used to use, if you know where to look. And if you come with me, I'll show you. In the middle of the 19th century, when mining was really beginning to take off here in Laxey, most miners would obviously want to live as near to the mine as possible. And for those who lived here in Dumbles Row, it was ideal. You just crossed over the road to work. I mean, the mine entrance is just down there. But for most other miners, it was an altogether different story. This is all that's left of a miner's cottage from the 19th century, and it's here in Lonnon, high in the hills above Laxey. And it's in a place like this that miners would have lived in with their families. It's really a small croft, rather like a small farmstead, and to supplement their living, miners would have kept maybe a pig in the sty here, or maybe even a cow or some other kind of livestock in the outbuildings which would have been up here. And in the land round about, they would have planted vegetables and crops. Most miners' cottages would be like this. They would have had thatched roofs, and they were very small. As well as looking after their croft, some miners spent their spare time helping with the harvest or even going fishing. It was the mining equivalent of shell stacking to earn an extra couple of quid, as spending eight hours a day underground was only part of the story. It was a hard life, and to make matters worse, it was pretty crowded in here. One miner who was killed by falling rocks at the Laxey mine left a wife and 14 children to live in a cottage like this one. Not much privacy to get dressed in here in the morning then. But before you became a miner as a young man, you might have spent much of your childhood working in a place like this. Because in the middle of the 19th century, when you weren't forced to go to school, many poor families sent their young boys here to the washing floors. And I know it's hard to imagine looking at this area today, but this whole site used to look like this. 
This was one of the most extraordinary places on the island. Powered by water from the nearby river, there were giant water wheels, stone crushers, sieves for sorting the different sized stones, and huge jiggers that shook them back and forth. And amongst all this activity, boys as young as 12 were employed, often in appalling conditions, especially during the freezing winter months. If you look closely at the old photograph, some of the features that were there in the 1880s can still be seen today, including the tunnel under the road. Out of this tunnel came a tiny steam engine, pulling behind it trucks packed full of rock which had been mined further up the valley. The tracks then ran through where this wall now stands and out onto those pillars. The trucks ran on rails that were suspended over here and when they got here they were tipped up and the rocks would go tumbling down to the waiting work crews below. Once the stones got down here, the first thing to do was sort them, and this is where the young boys came in. Because 12-year-olds have such good eyesight, they were ideal for sorting the useless bits of rock, like this, from the valuable lead ore, like this. In this photo from the 1870s, you can see the piles of stones that have been sorted. The ones of no value were taken away by wheelbarrows. The ones with ore in were taken and processed to get the metal out. But what you have to remember is conditions here were appalling for men, women and children. And during the long winter months it was freezing and wet. This place wasn't covered over. They said you had to run with your wheelbarrow to keep warm. And it's hard to imagine the hours. The normal working day was from 7am to 6pm, Monday to Friday, 11 hour days. But on Saturdays, you only had to work a 10 hour day. One hour off on a Saturday, isn't that generous? And if you look closely at this 19th century group photo of miners at Foxdale, you can see the young boys down on the washing floors, doing much the same job as they would have done at Laxey. But good eyesight wasn't the only thing that made young boys an asset to the mine. Their size meant that at the age of 15, they were permitted to go on the steam trains. Great, you may think, sounds like a good laugh, but trust me, playing trains down a mine was no game. The line ran from here at the washing floors, under the road, up the valley and deep underground into the mine, and the young boys were employed to hook and unhook the wagons from behind the tiny steam engine. Often, it's reported, the links between the trucks would break leaving the boy stranded deep underground, in the dark, with his single candle for light. It wasn't until the driver arrived back at the washing floors that he'd realise his lad was missing and go back for him. Sitting alone waiting in a cold, dark mine isn't exactly my idea of fun, even if I was being paid a whole nine pence a day for it. When the boy became a young man, he was at last allowed to join one of the many teams of miners that worked together and shared the pay. And this was where the real work started, because the working day began very early in the miner's cottage. Hopefully everyone was still asleep when the miner left for work. If he was on the day shift, he'd have to start work at 6am, which meant getting up in the middle of the night. Miners wore flannel shirts underneath their jackets, as flannel was good for absorbing sweat. In fact, miners were so covered in sweat that at the end of the shift, they were known to take off their shirts and wring them out. And there was no antiperspirant in those days, so as I'm doing this the authentic way, be glad you can only see me. Now, another essential piece of gear was the calico skull cap which was worn underneath the hard hat, like this. Now the hard hat was used to protect the miner's head from all the low rocks and the beams down the mine. And at the front here was where a miner would have stuck his candle with a lump of clay. 
Oh, I wonder what the ever-present health and safety would have to say about that today. Nowadays, we've got chocolate bars and sweet drinks to have as packed lunches, but the miners had no such thing, and they had to take with them enough supplies to last the whole day underground, because they couldn't just pop back up to the surface for a drink. They would take with them what they called a piece in their pockets, wrapped in a handkerchief with a bottle of water. A piece was usually a couple of slices of bread, homemade bread of course, with some butter spread on it, and as a little treat, and to keep the energy up for when they're working underground, they would sprinkle some sugar on it. And then all this would have been wrapped in a handkerchief. And some miners even preferred sandwiches of bread and herring to take down with them. Herring, could you imagine the smell of fish down a mine? Oh. Well, that's me ready for work. Can you see me? Can you see anything at all? <laughs> Didn't think so. This is about as much light as miners would have had to guide them across miles of open countryside and rough terrain in the 19th century. And if I had to be at the mine for six in the morning, then the walk to work was the beginning of a long and arduous day. And <laughs> trust me, taking your dog for a walk at this time in the morning was definitely out of the question. Many miners are known to have walked miles across the countryside every day and the light from their lanterns could have been seen going across the hillsides at night on their way home. Following his long walk over the hills, the miner would have reached here, the entrance to the mine, but there was still a long way to go yet. Across the river there once stood a series of buildings which formed the entrance to the Great Laxey Mine. And next to the entrance once stood the Changing Room, or as it was called, the Dry, where miners would have prepared themselves for a day's work. It was called the Dry because inside these buildings was a huge boiler that kept the building comfortably warm 24 hours a day, and dried the miners' clothes when they came up from the deep mine. It was in there in the changing rooms that the miner would have collected his tools such as his hammer and chisel that he would have needed for a day's work underground in the mine. He would have also collected a string of spare candles. He would then have gone just into the entrance there and collected a lump of clay brought from clay head. He would stick it to the front of his hat, he would then light a candle and stick it into the clay and then he was ready for the long journey into the deep dark mine. This is the main adit, or access tunnel, that the miners came along before reaching the vertical shafts, which would take them deep underground. Like pretty much everywhere else in the mine, it's constantly wet, as it was an outlet for the water, which was being pumped up from the levels below. One thing you notice when you're down the mine, apart from the ever-present water around your ankles and dripping down the back of your neck, is the weight of this hefty hat. It's about four times the weight of an ordinary hat, and was designed to protect the miners' heads from falling rocks and to prevent them from banging their heads. Now, at six foot four, I'm a lot taller than your average Victorian miner. Most of them found they could stand up down here quite comfortably and they would only bang their heads occasionally. Oof! This is becoming so not funny. The extent of the underground workings was huge, as this diagram of the shafts and tunnels shows and as the mine got deeper, it flooded with water, and had to be constantly pumped out. To do this pumping, the Great Laxey Wheel was built in 1854, and it's turned by water that is forced up the tower at the back, and which falls onto the wheel. A rod runs back from the wheel, supported by a series of stone arches. The rod runs some 180 metres up the valley, 
where it's connected to the top of a huge rocker. As the rod pulls this backwards and forwards, it lifts and lowers the pumping rods that brings the water up deep from underground. When you were down there, the sound of the pumps could be heard along the tunnels. The miners said it was like the wheezing of a monster with asthma. Looking at the diagram again, you can see how huge the underground area was, especially when you compare it with the size of the Laxi wheel. As you can see from the remains of the old train tracks here, this is where the mine's railway once ran to collect the ore. Now, conditions at present down this mine are about as pleasant as having your teeth drilled, but can you imagine what it was like with thick black smoke in the air from the steam engine which was pounding up and down at regular intervals? Miners walking along the tunnel would have got out of the way of the train by standing in specially made alcoves. And even today, all these years later, thick, greasy deposits of soot can still be seen on the roof of the tunnel. This bit of ladder here is actually one of the original wooden ladders that miners would have climbed down to the lower reaches of the mine. The climb could have been as much as 600 metres and it would only have been lit by a miner's candle. It's all flooded down there now, of course. The pumps have been disconnected for over 80 years. The Laxi wheel is no longer connected to them. The extraordinary climb that miners had to make at the beginning and end of their eight-hour shift could take up to an hour to complete each way. No wonder they needed to stop and smoke a pipe when they got to the bottom, though considering the poor air quality in here, I can't see how that would have made matters any better. No wonder one visitor to the mine described a sickening smell arising from the shafts. And I wonder what you did if you needed to go to the loo. Standing here in this tiny tunnel, it's hard to imagine just how far this shaft below me actually drops. But just to give you some idea, I've got a great way to show you. Well, any excuse for a trip to Blackpool? This is the world famous Blackpool Tower. It's the tallest landmark in the northwest of England, and it proudly stands at a height of over 155 metres above the promenade here. Now, just to give you some idea of how far that shaft in the mine actually drops, at its deepest point, it's the equivalent of four Blackpool Towers stacked on top of one another. No wonder it took the miners so long to climb down the shaft to work every morning. Here I am on the platform at the top of Blackpool Tower, and below me is a great demonstration of what it might have felt like to look down a mineshaft. This is the Walk of Faith, a glass panel in the floor that tests the nerve of visitors to the top of the tower. And that is what 155 metres straight down actually looks like. But remember, the miners had to climb down up to four times that height to the lower reaches of the mine. It's just as well that the darkness stopped them from seeing the whole way down in one go. Because let's face it, I couldn't climb down that on flimsy wooden ladders. Could you? Look at this tower and imagine miners having to climb down near vertical ladders, crisscrossing their way down four times the height of it. Then take away the daylight, add mud and water, and you've got the miners climb to work. Obviously, from the mine owner's point of view, Having your workmen spend two hours climbing the shafts wasn't very efficient. So in 1883, the Laxi mine had an ingenious machine installed, which was called the man engine. The engine itself was near the surface, and it was amazingly complicated with its valves and tubes. But it worked. Attached to it was a wooden rod that ran down a shaft for more than 420 metres. But it was in a chamber 60 metres below the engine that the miners actually started their descent, having walked there along a tunnel. And this is the chamber, though it hasn't been used by a miner for over 80 years. 60 metres above me is the man engine, and this 
is the rod hanging below it, still intact after all these years. Well, almost. The rod still hangs here, and it's incredible to think that this was put in place by miners dangling on the end of ropes by the light of a candle. The man engine is actually a huge hydraulic machine that moved this rod up and down about four metres. The rod actually goes down a further 365 metres below me, and every four metres down there's a platform which a miner could stand on. And then every four metres down on the side of the shaft there were platforms as well. The miner stood on the first platform at the top and was lowered down four metres. He then got off onto one of the platforms fixed to the side of the shaft and waited for the rod to bring up the next platform. He stepped on and was lowered down bit by bit to the bottom of the rod. There he would climb down a further 150 metres of ladders to the very lowest level. The mine owners were well pleased, as were the miners. The man engine reduced the journey time to the bottom of the mine from one hour down to 25 minutes. And here we are at last, down at the bottom of the mine, the end of the miners' long journey to work. It's down here that they would have spent up to eight hours every day unearthing lead, copper and zinc. Every section of the mine was worked by a group of miners. They would spend hours hammering chisels into the rock, setting dynamite charges and blowing huge chunks of rock out from within the mineral vein. In some places, the grooves made by the chisels can still be seen. The surrounding rock would have been blown away by the dynamite. And as you can imagine, there were many tragic accidents using the explosives in such a confined space. Sometimes the mineral veins would go upwards through the roof of the tunnel and miners would hack away at this, going higher and higher until they reached the tunnel above. These areas were called stopes and their sides were kept apart by timber beams, some of which still survive after 80 years. Despite the appalling conditions, there is a certain beauty about the inside of the mine, with its mysterious chambers and the exquisite colours of the minerals that ooze out of the rocks. The area a candle lights up is actually rather small. You certainly can't see a tunnel with it. You're surrounded by a blanket of darkness. And just imagine what happens if that single candle blows out and you're left all alone in the darkness. <laughs> Anyone see where I put the matches? At the end of the day, the miners climbed to the surface and walked along the tunnel that eventually brought them to the exit from the mine. They were out, once again, into the light and the fresh air. But that wasn't the end of it for the miner. He didn't simply fill in a timesheet and wait for the cheque to clear. Miners were paid on the first Saturday of the month, and each team would gather together, dressed in their best clothes, around the washing floors, and the team leader would hand out their pay. Many miners recall groups of men sitting around holding out their hats for their share of the bargain payment. Sometimes there was great disappointment at the end of the month if the part of the mine the group had been working hadn't yielded much ore. Miners were paid on delivery. If they didn't produce the goods, they didn't get paid, no matter how hard they worked. This is pittance. You should have a hate me more. Is there a problem? What is this? I've worked hard as any other man. I know exactly. You've got exactly the same as me. We worked alongside each other. There's more in your pocket. Nothing in my pocket. Come on. Ah. Come on, lads. Poor wages wasn't something that bothered the mine owners, though. They always got a substantial part of the takings and a share of the profits as well. During the winter months, there were many recreational activities for the miners to partake in at the Working Men's Institute here in Laxey. There were dominoes and other such games, there was a library and there were education classes for those who may have missed out on schooling. But during the warmer summer months, many miners would have spent their time in a place like this, playing football. Eventually, as with many great industries, mining declined. And after cheaper lead was being imported from Australia at the beginning of the last century, 
The Laxey mines closed, and in 1929, the pumps and the winding gear were switched off for the last time, and the majority of the mine quickly flooded with water. Since then, the mines have remained largely untouched. The big wheel up there still turns, though now it's for the tourists rather than the pumps. And nature has begun to cover over many of the scars which the mining has left on the Manx landscape. But many of the ruined buildings will remain for years to come as eerie testaments to the toil and hardship which miners had to endure so many years ago, deep underground in these dark, wet tunnels.